Well, good morning, Rethink Life. You guys doing good? Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's do me, hey, do me a big favor. Let's give those that are watching us right now a warm round of applause. And when I say warm, I mean warm. We need all the warmth that we can get. So thankful that you're part of our experience in this moment and just looking forward to what God wants to do in each of our hearts and what he wants to accomplish in our lives as we continue with uh, an exciting future that God has for us for 2017. And uh, as you just heard on the video announcement a second ago, uh, we're just really excited about next week. You don't want to miss it. What an incredible opportunity for you to reach out to some friends, um, some people that you know that normally wouldn't go to church. This is going to be a great day of celebration. I can't wait to get our whole church under one roof and one place at one time. It's going to be an exciting day. And uh, also this evening at 4 uh, p.m. over at Three Points Bowling Alley, we're just going to be celebrating and honoring our amazing dream team. We're just going to have fun. We're have a sports theme. I'll be rocking my Tony Romo jersey. But uh, it's only Tony. It's Tony Romo. was like, man, that Tony Romo. He's like a has been. Well, well, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. But hey, it's the only jersey I got. Okay. But we're going to be having an awesome time with our dream team as we just uh, really celebrate the amazing difference they make in the life of our church. In fact, would you just give our dream teamers a round of applause? The men and the women, the students that serve every single week to make such an incredible difference in so many different ways. And uh, we could not do what we do without them. And so we're excited for what God has in store. And then Thursday night, I just want to encourage you. I know uh, for those of you that are here today on a, on a Sunday, let me just encourage you to mark your calendar for Thursday night. We're having just a night of worship we're really excited about just as we prepare for the big day next week on Sunday. But also Thursday night is going to be an opportunity for us to come together, just have an evening of worship, communion, time of prayer. And uh, what an incredible time we've had over the last 21 days during our 21-day prayer and fasting emphasis. And um, this is just going to be an awesome way for us to celebrate what God has done and continue just to consecrate an amazing year of 2017 for the Lord. We've been, we've been talking about making change, and we've been talking about the importance of uh, incorporating different changes in our lives. And one of the things we've learned over the last few weeks is we've been talking about the importance of incorporating four specific principles in our lives so that no matter what maybe change or uh, goal, aspiration that you're striving for, one of the things that we're ultimately trying to accomplish is what, what God wants to do in our hearts, what changes He needs to make in our lives. Because I'm convinced that when we embrace these four truths that we're talking about, it's going to help us achieve all the other things that we are that we are so committed to seeing happen in our lives. And so we've been talking about those over the last four weeks. And if you've been here, hopefully you've been challenged and stretched a little bit. Uh, week one, we talked about the importance of learning the principle and applying the principle of less is more. Uh, we talked about week two, the principle of stress is bad. Week three, we talked about giving is good. And today we're going to talk about tomorrow matters. So let's just see how well you've been remembering that. We have the four icons here behind me. And so I'm going to say them. I'm going to repeat them. Just, I'm going to say them one time. I want you to repeat them with me. All right. Here we go. Less is more. Stress is bad. Giving is good. Tomorrow matters. All right. One more time. Come on. Less is more. Stress is bad. Giving is good. Tomorrow matters. So if you're taking notes today, I hope you'll jot down this one important sentence because it's really the, the sermon in a sentence. And the principle is this. Because tomorrow matters, I must make a difference today. Now, because tomorrow matters, I must make a difference with my life today. Now, here's the thing you got to remember. The Bible says we're not even promised tomorrow. And so because we're not promised tomorrow, how much more important is it for us to figure out a way that we can fulfill a purpose, a greater purpose, God's purpose for our lives today? And so when you think about the urgency of the moment, the urgency of this day, and what I can do, what you can do to make a difference on this day with my life, then there's some things that we've got to learn to understand when it comes to helping us achieve the very thing that God placed this on this earth to fulfill. And I don't think there's obviously a greater example than the life of Jesus. In fact, there was an incredible story 
Uh, in fact, if you have your Bibles, you can open them up or open up our Bible, or excuse me, our uh, church app there on your, your phone. Um, we have the notes there provided for you. But in Luke chapter 5, um, I love this story about um, what we're going to be learning today because it's just, it's so, there's so much imagery, there's so much um, reality as it relates to what the situation was and ultimately what we can learn from the situation because I think if anything, this is exactly what we need to do when it comes to making a difference with our lives today because tomorrow does matter. And so we're going to pick it up here in Luke chapter 5, looking at verses 17 and 20. And what's interesting is that Jesus was teaching and there was a moment that literally forced him to stop uh, in the middle of his teaching to take notice. Everybody took notice what was happening, but we're going to learn the reason why it happened and ultimately what was accomplished. Looking at verse 17 in Luke chapter 5, follow along with me as I read. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were seated nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all of Galilee and Judea as well as from Jerusalem. The Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. And some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. And they tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd, right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Now, there are three things that I want us to learn from this particular story, three takeaways, if you will, that, that we can apply. And the first is this. Because tomorrow matters, I, you, we must make a difference with our lives today. So, so how do we do that? Well, Jesus taught us something very, very important. Right at the gate, what he teaches us in this story is that we must embrace interruptions. We've got to embrace interruptions interruptions with our lives if we're going to make today count, if we're going to make a difference with our lives. What's interesting is that Jesus had been away, he'd been ministering, and uh, one day he just kind of uh, abruptly shows up unannounced, and uh, he showed up in this little community, it was really a fishing community known as Capernaum, and uh, just on the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. And so in this little community or in this little village, Jesus happens to show up, word quickly gets out, and people wanted to go see Jesus. Obviously, you can only imagine when people learned that Jesus was in town, man, people had heard about Jesus. In fact, some perhaps had even eyewitnessed Jesus perform so many incredible miracles. And so in this moment, people wanted to go see him. They wanted to go hear him. They wanted just to be around him. They wanted to be in his presence. And so Jesus happens to be at a home. Many scholars believe it was the Apostle Peter's house. And so this place is completely packed out. Standing, there, standing room only crowd. I mean, this is, this, I'm just sure there's a buzz. There's a, there's a sense of electricity and excitement, anticipation. And the master teacher is teaching in this moment with a packed house. And all of a sudden, in the middle of his teaching to some very important religious people, all of a sudden there's this commotion. All of a sudden, I can only picture maybe, you know, the ceiling tiles, you know, from, from the ceiling, suddenly they're, they're beginning to fall, perhaps right in front of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, you see, the, you see the, the roof open and you see this man being lowered down into the room. Picture this now. Here is a man who's paralyzed, brought by some of his friends to this house with anticipation of getting this friend to Jesus, who is the great physician, the one who is the master healer, the one who could transform and change their friend's life. But yet when they got there, they couldn't get in. So instead, they went up to the roof, they cut out a hole, they lowered the friend down into the living room of this home, and there Jesus is teaching when all of a sudden he is forced to stop. He was abruptly interrupted in this moment. I've been in ministry for, I've been speaking for over 28 years, and um, I have been in a lot of situations as a, 
uh, teacher, preacher, pastor, communicator, we would call it. Um, in fact, for 14 and a half years, I traveled all over the country and other places around the world and uh, spoke to over 2,000 public and private schools to over two and a half million uh, students. And so I would go into auditoriums, I'd go into um, you know, gymnasiums where I would conduct a student body school assembly. Well, I've been in situations where literally in the middle of me speaking, a fight would break out among some students in the, in the bleachers, you know, right in the middle of an assembly. I've had power outages. I've had where the sound, you know, just completely goes out. Lights go out. I have smoke alarms, fire alarms, you know, going off. I've been in situations where a man literally had a heart attack um, in the middle of the service. I've had people pass out. Um, I, I have been in situations, uh, one time I was speaking, and I could not for the life of me figure out why everybody was looking up and laughing, and I was like, what did I do? You know, what happened? What's, what's going on? And what did I say? And I could not for the life of me figure out why these people were laughing and why in the world their focus was not on me. It was up in the rafters, and the reason why is because there were birds flying around in the rafter of the church, you know, and people were just, you know, completely enamored by these birds. I've been in a situation where uh, I'll never forget as long as I live. There was a guy in South Carolina. Uh, some, some believed he was a part of a cult nearby. Um, I don't know if he was a part of a cult. All I know to do is cray-cray. He literally every night would come and hear me speak. He would sit on the back, and just about the time I would get ready to wrap up the message. I'm telling you, right when I had it in the palm of my hand, the dude would get up, he would walk down the center aisle of the church, and he would just stand there, and he would stare at me. And the very first time the guy did that, I was like, what in the world? Night after night, this happened. I was asking questions. Who is this guy? What is he doing? He's giving me the heebie-jeebies. And sure enough, come to find out, the dude was praying against me. He had it all figured out. But I'm telling you, the dude was cray-cray. I've been in a situation, I don't know if I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, it was before I was getting ready to speak, and they were doing a little baptism celebration. There was this big old dude that they were baptizing that night. And this is, this is, you know, in a church environment where they have like what they call a choir loft, where the choir, you know, is behind. And uh, they had the baptistry built into the, to the top portion of the church. And uh, so this big guy was taken down into the water. The pastor was getting ready to baptize him. I don't know what happened. The dude freaked out a little bit, grabbed the glass, grabbed the glass with his hand, and literally... The glass just burst. Water comes flowing down the baptistry onto the stage. We had to call her, we had to call her quits that night. I mean, it, was, it was crazy. But I'm telling you, I've been in all kinds of situations where I have been abruptly interrupted. But here's the thing we got to realize. In Jesus' life and in his ministry, that was the norm for him. You can only imagine Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, the one that everybody wanted to see, everybody wanted healing, everybody wanted salvation, everybody wanted forgiveness, everybody wanted to learn from Jesus. And so Jesus was always being interrupted from someone with a desperate situation, with a desperate need, and they literally threw themselves to Jesus because they were so desperately wanting his power and his presence in their lives. And so here's the thing we learn from Jesus. Jesus never saw interruptions as an inconvenience. Jesus always saw interruptions as an opportunity to make a difference in someone's life or eternity. And so one of the things we have to realize is this, is that life is too short to allow the daily interruptions what often can be disguised as a divine appointment to serve as an inconvenience. It just might be that God allowed the interruption in your life for a greater reason or a purpose because there's a divine appointment and God wants you to leverage the interruption as an opportunity to help someone who perhaps needs your help in that moment that could make a difference in their life. And so the question today is this. For you, do you see interruptions as an inconvenience? Or perhaps do you see interruptions as an opportunity to reach out to someone, to pray for someone, to meet a need in someone's life, to step up where God could use you in that moment to be the very thing that maybe that person needed in that moment 
in their life. And so here's what the scripture says in Luke 9, verse 62. But Jesus told them, anyone who lets himself be distracted from the work I plan for, for him is not fit for the kingdom of God. Every day, we ought to wake up and say, God, what can I do to make myself available? God, what can I do to look for opportunities? God, I don't want to see this day... I don't want to see this day in such a way to where I'm only thinking about myself or my, my agenda or the things that I got to get done or what perhaps is important to me. No, 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 no. God, I realize you put me on this earth for a reason. There is a plan. There is a purpose. You have something great for me. And God, I'm making myself available. Because listen to me, our availability can be used as an opportunity in someone else's life. And so we've got to learn to embrace interruptions why because tomorrow matters and because tomorrow matters I must make a difference today so rather than seeing interruptions as inconveniences we got to see them as opportunities so that we can be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus in the moment in someone else's life so the second thing is this not only do we need to embrace interruptions because tomorrow matters but if I'm gonna make a difference with my life today I've got to also be proactive with my life. I've got to be proactive. You know, the thing I love about the story are the four friends. I love the fact that these four friends, when they caught wind that Jesus was in town, you know what they did? They saw this opportunity and they seized the moment. And here's what they did. They perhaps had been praying for their friend. They perhaps had been in, in their, in their, maybe in their own way, trying to figure out a way to reach out to their paralyzed friend. I mean, here is a friend who's paralyzed, he's helpless, he's hopeless in the situation. And so you have these four friends who leverage the moment. They take their friends to, 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 to this house where Jesus was speaking. And yet when they arrived, you can only imagine what they must have experienced when they saw literally a packed house, perhaps people standing outside, people perhaps, you know, peering through the windows, people who, who were just doing whatever they could just to get close enough, just to even hear what Jesus was saying. And all of a sudden, these four guys show up. And I can only imagine when they saw the crowd what they must have been thinking. Chances are, for many of us, had we experienced the same thing, you know what we would have done? We perhaps would have been reactive and said, man, I can't believe this. What a bummer. Man, I didn't realize all these people were going to be here. Well, I guess, I guess it wasn't meant to be. And what happens is that when we see an obstacle, or maybe when we see a barrier... We allow those barriers to maybe disguise themselves, maybe as an inconvenience. But what you got to realize is that these four guys, because they were proactive in their faith, they were willing to do whatever it took to reach their friend because their friend needed to get to Jesus. It didn't matter how many people were there, what kind of obstacles were in their way. They were so proactive and they, they had such a strong belief just believing if they could just get their friend to Jesus. If they could just get their friend to Jesus, he would make, he would make the difference in his life. So rather than seeing the crowds as a barrier, here's what they did in their hearts. They believed that God was bigger than the barrier of all of those people. And because they were strong in their faith, they took proactive measures to do whatever it took. As a result, they thought outside the box. They refused to take no for an answer. They climbed up on top of the roof. They got, dug out this hole. They lowered their friend to Jesus. And I love what Jesus did. Jesus said, because of your faith. He wasn't referencing the faith of the paralyzed man. He was referencing the faith of these four friends who were proactive, who strongly believed. That, listen, with God, all things are possible. Jesus recognized their faith. And he said, young man, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because of four guys who were proactive, who believed that God was bigger than their barriers, and they refused to bail before the breakthrough. Listen, there are some of you here today that are listening to my voice. Those of you that are watching right now, listen to me. Some of you are allowing opportunities to serve 
in your mind, maybe as an interruption. Maybe it's an inconvenience. And because you see it as an inconvenience, that inconvenience is serving as a barrier for you to experience something greater that God wants to accomplish in your life. Now listen, some of you are like the paralyzed man. Some of you are paralyzed maybe by your past. You're paralyzed by present circumstances that you're currently facing. Some of you are paralyzed because of of the fear of the unknown, the future. And so you feel stuck. You feel helpless. You feel hopeless. But yet at the same time, you're afraid to take the next step because you see it as being too difficult. You see it as an interruption. You see it maybe as an inconvenience. I've learned this. When I interact with a lot of people and I'm asking them questions, I say, hey, tell me where you are in your spiritual journey. You know, it's interesting to me is that so often people will say to me, well, you know, I, I would love to, but I can't. Well, why can't you? Well, you know, we've got this commitment or we've got that commitment. And I understand there are various commitments in our lives that are important, but at the same time, so often what happens is we use the other commitments in our lives to really serve as an inconvenience because in our mind we see it as an interruption to our routine, to our agenda, to our schedule. And the unfortunate thing is, is that we're allowing other so-called important commitments or other conflicts to rob us for, from greater things that God wants to accomplish. And so my question to you is, what is it that's keeping you from taking the next steps in your spiritual journey? For some of you, maybe it's getting baptized. That's why we're doing baptism next weekend for the big day, February 5th. Pack the pack that we're gonna that we're gonna close it out with our big after party and part of our after party is just a big celebration. We're gonna see people water baptized. Well, guess what? For us, some of us, rather than seeing that as an opportunity, we see that as an inconvenience. We see that as a as a situation that's just you know intimidating. Well, listen, others, you may be here today. What's keeping you from maybe taking next steps? You may maybe it's the fear. Or maybe it's maybe you're using your past or your maybe your your inadequacies as a maybe as a, as a barrier that's holding you back from taking the next steps in your spiritual journey once again you're robbing yourself from what God wants to accomplish in you and through you and here's what here's here's something so important when I hear people say well I'm just not ready I, I just I just you know I just there's a lot of things in my life that I got to get straightened out I got to get figured out I got to sort through some things I have to just kind of work through some issues in my life I get that understand that but listen if you see yourself as a person who is not qualified or not ready, you need to understand this very important truth. Jesus does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. God gives you everything you need. He'll equip you. He'll empower you to, to help you take the next steps in your spiritual journey. Nobody wants you to succeed more than Jesus. He died for you. He came back to life for you. And he's with you. He's for you. And he's going to help you resolve the issues. He's going to help you overcome. Why? Because he overcame. Because he overcame, you can already overcome the things that Jesus Christ has allowed you to overcome because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. He's alive in you, and you can overcome the things. God just wants you to trust him in the journey. And so today, be proactive in your faith. Be proactive. Don't react, say, well, I can't, no, it's too hard, I got this, I got that. Don't see it as an inconvenience or an interruption. See it as an opportunity for something great that God wants to accomplish. That's the reason why today, when you're dismissed, here in just a few moments, you're going to have the opportunity to go out into our, our lobby. And it's an opportunity for you just to interact and, and find an opportunity for you to connect in a life group. So you can do life with other people. And let me close with this, this, this statement because it's so important. The Bible says, in Ephesians chapter 5, that we are to make the most of every opportunity. Why? Why? Because of these evil days. We're li- we're, listen, we are living in desperate times. We're living in evil days. And you were never, ever, ever, ever designed or meant or created to do life alone. Which leads me to the last thing, and that is this. 
Because tomorrow matters, because tomorrow matters, I must make a difference with my life today. How? By embracing interruptions, by living proactive, by simply waking up every day, proactively pursuing my faith journey, pursuing the next steps, pursuing God's agenda, pursuing his plan, pursuing his purpose. But here's the key. I have to do life with others you see if we're gonna make a difference with our lives today because tomorrow matters we can't do it alone we got to do life with other people you know one of the things that's interesting about this story is this in fact here's a question I have for you how many people did it take to reach the paralyzed man four it took four to reach the one. Every one of those four perhaps had a purpose, had an assignment. There was a job, there was a task for them to do. Had one of them not shown up, had one of them bailed before the breakthrough, it may not have ever happened. The man had never perhaps, he would have never been able to meet Jesus. He perhaps would have never been healed. He would have never been forgiven. He would have never been perhaps given a second chance. But all four showed up. All four reached out. All four rescued. All four were engaged. All four were doing it together. Why? Because they understood the value of being together and not doing life alone. Because they loved their friend and they cared for their friend. Because they knew their friend was dependent upon them. They weren't going to let their friend down. And that's what kind of friends and relationships that we need desperately in our lives. We need people in our lives we need to be a part of a group we need to be a part of a team you know why you know why we call it dream team here at rethink life because it's exactly what it is we're fulfilling the dream that god has for your life and mine and it takes teamwork to make his dream work you see the word team simply stands for together Everyone achieves more. When we live life and do life together with people who have the same heart, the same mind, same purpose as we do, guess what? We're stronger together. We're better together. It's better to grow together. We're going to learn from one another. Why? The Bible says the iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Listen, I can learn from you. You can learn from me. We can pray for one another. We can support one another. We can encourage one another. We can speak life together. We can do things together. We can, listen, we can have, listen, a life together that is accomplishing a greater purpose than our own, and that is fulfilling the purposes of God together because it makes not just us stronger it makes our relationship stronger it makes the church stronger it makes the body of Christ stronger and listen it makes the kingdom of God stronger because the more we grow listen it advances the church and he and, and all of heaven grows and that's God's plan it's God's purpose is that together we achieve more one of the things that I love about Ecclesiastes, this passage just says this in verses 9 and 10, Ecclesiastes 4. Two people are better together. They're better than one because together they have a good reward for their hard work. Now notice, if one falls, the other can help his friend get up. But how tragic it is for the one who is all alone when he falls. Because there's no one to help him get up. If tomorrow matters, which it does, then the question is, what can I do with my time? How can I leverage my talents, like we talked about last week? How can I leverage my treasure to make an eternal difference? But in order to accomplish that in a more effective way, I need to accomplish it doing it with other people. And one of the things that our life groups are designed to do is actually three things. One, 
is to help people get connected. Some of you here need to meet other people like yourself. Some of you need to connect with people, listen, on a relational level, at whatever stage or season of life that you're currently in, you need to connect with those people. Some of you, you have friends at work, and that's great. Some of you, you have, uh, you have a circle of friendships through your children because of their friends and their parents and, and the activities and maybe the, uh, the extracurriculars. You know, that allows all of you to kind of have a, a sense of community, and that's all great, too. I encourage that. I support that. But there's another group of friends that you need in your life, and they can be those other friends. They can be a part of those other groups. But you need people in your life that you can connect with, not just relationally, but spiritually. You need people who can help you grow. That's the second reason why we have life groups. It's not just to help people connect but to help people grow. We want to see you grow in your spiritual journey. We want to see you flourish in those next steps. We want to see you get stronger in your marriage relationship. We want to help you, listen, strengthen your relationships, even if you're single. We want to help you strengthen your relationships because in this season of preparation, it's going to make you stronger. Your roots are going to grow deeper. You're going to position yourself spiritually, emotionally, relationally. Listen, everything is setting you up, preparing you to become the person whom God has created you to be so that you're ready and fully prepared for whoever that next person is going to be in your life. You need people that you can connect with, that you can grow with, but you need people who will protect you. We need people in our lives that are there to speak the truth and love, who, who's got our back, who, who love us in such a way to where they just want the best from us. People who are going to remind us and hold us accountable when they see us disconnect, when they see us fall off into maybe into the, into the weeds when, when we maybe aren't, aren't showing up or maybe we're, we're drifting in our spiritual life. Hey, we need a friend who notices that and loves us enough to say, hey, I've noticed you've missed or hey, I've noticed something's not right. What can I do? How can I help? Is there a way I can pray for you? Man, let's, let's invite God into that situation. Amen. And so when we connect and we grow and we help protect one another, what does that do? It helps us flourish. And that's why God doesn't want us to do life alone. So I can't wait for our next series. We're calling it Hashtag Squad Goals. And we're going to be talking about, you know, your squad. We're going to be talking about the people in your life that are so vitally important. Because they'll either make you or they will break you. Trust me. And so today, as we're dismissed, I want you to linger a little longer. And because it's cold outside, we've got it all figured out. So what you can do is linger a little longer out in the foyer, get your cup of coffee, and let us walk you through our life groups because today we're officially launching our life group semester. And so we have a little booth area of some balloons. We've got a TV monitor. We've got some folks out there with little iPads. And they will, listen, they will literally show you how to find a group. It could be an activity-based group, something around a hobby, a special interest that you enjoy doing. It could be maybe just another topical group. Maybe it's an area that you just really want to stretch and grow and learn from others. Or maybe you want to help mentor other people through that. Whatever it is, we want to help you find a place to connect, a group that you can be a part of. And so I'm going to encourage you to go out into the lobby in just a moment and just linger and just learn and just ask questions and meet some people. And you may be here today and you're thinking, man, I would, I would love to do something around this. It's a hobby. It's a passion I have. Or I love serving. I love doing community out in the community and doing things to, to serve other people. There are other people in, you know, that in our church that love the same thing. Absolutely. We call those serve groups. There's just all kinds of opportunities of outreach to make a difference. And so at the end of the day... Because tomorrow matters, we have to make our life count today. How do we do that? We embrace interruptions. We understand the importance of living our lives proactively, pursuing the faith journey and steps that God has for us, fulfilling his purpose. But we need to do it together with other people. Why? Because we were never designed to do it alone. Amen. It's better together. So the four principles is this. 
Less is more. You've got to say no to a lot of good things that you're going to be presented with. So you can say yes to the best things that God has for you. Because when you say yes to a lot of good things, guess what? Those good things become stressful. And stress is what? It's bad. So don't get so maxed out and leveraged out in your life where you no longer have time to invest in the eternal things. Because tomorrow matters, therefore today matters. And how we choose to live today is going to affect tomorrow. So make sure you leverage your time. You make sure you leverage your talents. You make sure you leverage your treasure. Listen, your financial resources. Why? Because giving is good. You cannot outgive God. You can't. So give it away for all eternity's sake. Why? Because tomorrow matters. And because it matters, I must make a difference with my life today. Let's bow our heads together in prayer.